program. So throughout the year, we've hosted mostly virtual talks on various topics related to aging, as well as co-sponsoring an aging symposium, which one of our speakers this evening, Ms. Amanda Biggs, was part of. So she might look familiar to some of you. Um, and if you'd like to have more information about our initiative, our events, please contact us at healthyaging at ecu.edu. Eva is going to type that address into the chat for you to see. Um, today, our moderator is going to be Miss Skylar Coley. And I know that she will introduce herself to you. So um, take it away. Hey, good evening, everyone. And I really appreciate you joining us um, for our second night of the film festival. We're very excited. Um, so as Dr. Schwartz said, I am Skylar Coley, and I'm a soon-to-be graduate of the Advanced Standing MSW program at East Carolina. Um, I also got my undergrad there, and during my time there, I was able to um, minor in gerontology, which kind of stemmed my interest for the aging community and the aging population. Um, so as I have grown in my academic career and my professional career, I would say my interest in this field has grown. Um, so if you have any interest in achieving, if you're an ECU student, achieving a uh, gerontology minor or even the certificate, you can reach out to Dr. Schwartz and she can provide lots of information about that. So to get started for this evening, um, I will be moderating, to, moderating today's panel, and we are excited to have Ms. Amanda Biggs, who is a family consultant with Project Care, and Ms. Laura Jett, who is the long-term long care ombudsman with the Mideast Commission Area on Aging, and they're here with us today. So I'm gonna give you guys both the opportunity to kind of introduce yourselves and talk about your interest. So who would like to go first? I'm gonna guess that's me, is that okay, Amanda? <laughs> okay, uh, so I am Laura Jett and I am a regional long-term care ombudsman. And for those who may not be familiar with that role, um, I work specifically as an advocate for residents in assisted living, uh, nursing home and family care home um, residences in five counties. And so my job is to promote residents' rights and try to help with um, grievance resolution with, within the facility um, setting with families and residents. Um, so that's just a little brief uh, what I do. Um, Skylar, would you like to let uh, Amanda share before we move on? Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Amanda Biggs. I'm the Project Care Family Consultant with Mideast Commission. And the care in my title stands for Caregivers Alternatives to Running on Empty. Um, my program is a dementia-specific program. I assist family caregivers who are taking care of their loved ones at home with a dementia diagnosis, um, with dementia education and training, the biggest part of my program is the respite grant funding that I can award the family caregivers. Um, and that is so that they can get someone to come in and assist them with caring for their loved one at home, trying to help prevent caregiver burnout and them from being so overwhelmed with their caregiving journey. So that's it, I'm glad to be here. Excellent, thank you guys so much. Um, and now I'd like to give you both the opportunity to kind of just share your just first impressions, I'd say, about the film and kind of your takeaways and, you know, any information you just really wanted to kind of address and start first with. Okay. So, Laura, if, you, if you'd like to go ahead and start. Okay. I, I'll start. I'll say I, I watched this film actually several times um, and called Amanda today and said, wow, you know, I have four pages of things I'd love to tell all of you. So, I will not, I will not do that. Um, but, you know, this film obviously um, has a lot of shock factor to it. And, um, you know, so first and foremost, I think Amanda and I both agree, we want to make sure everyone that has seen the film understands that um, this is not to say that all assisted livings um, operate this way. And there are some really wonderful homes out there that are doing some really great work, um, creating moments of joy. And, um, you know, assisted living is, is a level of care that's needed. 
Um, you know, we wouldn't have it if, if it didn't fulfill a need. We have families that can't pull, pick up that care. Uh, we have people that don't have family. Um, and so we really do need assisted living and we have some really good providers. So we always want to preface by saying there are some good providers out there. Um, but assisted living is not without its struggles and its problems. Um, and this film definitely brought up uh, several categories um, to consider. Um, regulatory issues, uh, certainly. Um, it brought up the staffing um, shortages and lack of training within uh, the documentary, as well as what you're paying for and what they're licensed for, um, because um, that that is key. And so I think as far as takeaways, um, I, I appreciate that people have have interest in this and did watch the film because we struggle trying to pre-educate the consumer out there because, um, you know, I'm looking for a house right now and I'm going out and I'm looking through houses and doing my homework and I'm not going to buy a house that I don't look at and I'm not going to sign a mortgage I haven't read. Um, but unfortunately, when we approach long-term care, a lot of times the consumers put the blinders on, no one wants to think about it. And then when it's needed, um, that's when I get the phone calls to give someone a crash course. And you know, you really need to know what you're getting and um, what your expectations are and um, how to talk to regulators if you if you need help. And so um, pre-education is important. So anyone on this uh, call today that you've taken that first step of, um, of doing that. So um, knowing what you're getting um, is important and there's ways to do that as a consumer. There are um, reports that the state uh, from their inspections that are posted publicly for your viewing so that you can read this facility's track record. Um, there's a star rating system in place. There's a point system in place. And those are some good starts to uh, understanding the system. Um, in, in terms of regulation, um, the film brought up a very good point and this is, uh, this is huge for us as ombudsmen. Um, the nursing home industry is tied to the federal dollar. They're taking Medicare and so they have federal standards. It's a nationwide set of standards. So the pandemic really um, kind of shows this point a little more in that uh, nursing homes had infection control surveys going on. They've had inspections going on throughout. They've been very busy in these homes. And um, our assisted living rules, um, nursing home rules tend to say the word shall lately. You know, you shall do this. That means you must. Um, the assisted living side of things uses the word may. Um, so there's some leeway to the provider on, on some of these things lately. And so regulation is a concern. Um, penalties that are imposed are, are whittled down sometimes, just as the film said. Um, we have homes with $7,000 penalties that were whittled down to 200. Um, and so that, you know, we do have some room for improvement in that. Um, I will say that um, as advocates, one thing we need to do is pay attention. Um, the industry has um, a few trade groups out there that are promoting right now to take away, um, well, to allow facilities to be accredited. And what that would do is if your facility is accredited, the state would no longer come in annually to survey you and the county would no longer come in uh, quarterly to survey you. You would have an outside accrediting body every three years. Um, and so in an industry where we're taking more complex health and uh, medical cases, and we already have issues, I don't think this is the time to um, start accrediting facilities um, with, with such little, within the bill, there's such little um, detail on who can be accredited. Um, so it doesn't say if you're a four-star facility, you could apply. It says if you've had a license 12 months, and that's not a long track record. So while there are problems, I don't think we need to nix the system right now. I don't think we need to impose something like that. Um, and then I know Amanda was going to talk a little bit about staffing and training, so I'm going to let her maybe talk about that a little more, but equipping our workforce, um, because we, we already don't have a huge workforce to pull from, and they're not well compensated, and sometimes we do set them up to fail by not providing the proper training, so um, I'll let Amanda touch on that a little more. Thank you, Laura. Um, I also want to piggyback off of um, something Laura said as well. Um, you know, going online and looking at the state regs and, and 
if there are any cases or anything about these assisted livings and nursing homes that you're looking to um, admit your loved one into. But also, you know, go in and, and just pop up at new places. Yeah, I know COVID-19 is on board now, and that's pretty much impossible at the moment. But just knowing that when you walk into a place, it's, it's, to me, it's all about the feeling. It's the feeling that you get that you're going to put your loved one there. Um, you know, look at what's going around. Um, go after hours. You know, what are you seeing? How, how is the staff inter inter um, intertwining with the, the clients, the, the recipients, the care recipients? You know, it's, to me, it's all about that feeling. Not every place is a good fit for you and your loved one. And knowing when you walk into that, build, that building, um, getting a good feeling of leaving your loved one there for someone else to care for um, is a major part of it as well. But yeah, so staffing and training, um, that was mentioned um, in the film as well. And that to me is a big red flag. Um, I, I, everyone is not cut out for this. Um, you have to have it in your heart to care for others. And it's just not for everyone. And it's okay that it's not for everyone, but it is important that the people that we do have in place to care for our loved ones in these assisted living communities, that they do have the proper training. Um, to me, it's not just enough to put someone in front of a computer and say, go do eight hours of training there. And now you're, you're trained and we can check that off your box and put that certificate in your file and just, put them on the floor and say sink or swim. That's not how we want our loved ones to be treated. That there needs to be in-depth, in-person training to go along with that computer training um, online. You know, I'm not saying that they can't have the computer training, but you know, it is very important that they do have the hands-on to take to take care of our loved ones. Um, you know, you wouldn't just trust your yourself to a surgeon who hasn't had the proper training to do a surgery, um, you know, so you want to make sure that these people do have their proper training. And there are so many resources out here for that. A lot of assisted living companies have their own training programs that are very, very good and very effective. Um, also, you know, having the staff go out to obtain um, other training outside of the building, um, you know, just for whatever, um, reason they may need though those certifications, those CEUs, and just knowing what to do to care for your loved one as an individual. Um, I think it's all about person-centered care, you know, as well. You know, knowing what my mom likes versus your mother is very important for that staff member to know. I don't think it's, everyone's not gonna fit in the same box. So knowing that personal-centered care and that personal touch for your loved one is very, very important and how that staff can deliver that um, is, is ultimate important, you know, as, as a family caregiver. Um, and like Laura said, I mean, these, not all the family care homes are the same, you know, the, the film that we watched um, just put me in tears, um, you know, to know that <laughs> these stories really existed. I mean, it, it, it just, it, it tugged at my heart for a long time. And, you know, it's just one of those things to make sure that we do our homework um, with, you know, when we're looking for placement for our loved one. It's, it's important that we go and, and, and go online and look at their record and, and make pop-up visits when we're able to again and, and things like that and, and get the feeling. Laura? Yeah, just kind of... Uh, piggybacking on that, it's it's important to note that the regulations that are that are here for assisted living, those are actually minimum standards, mm -hmm. and so those are the standards on the books for um, training and um, staffing for a you know your your minimum. And so, you know, one of the issues is that these facilities were initially designed for someone who was mobile who maybe needed a little help with their activities of daily living. I can dress myself, but I need buttons and zippers and socks to, right. you know, I can bathe myself, but, and um, what it's evolved to is um, just like the video said, in a lot of cases, uh, they, they come in the door and um, there's an expectation or, or maybe, maybe not a verbal promise, but it's, it's in there for some facilities that 
your loved one will never have to move again. And, and by licensure, you should never make that promise because you don't have a crystal ball on that person's health. And there are licensed tasks that you should not be doing. Um, there's not a registered nurse on site. They're contracted. They're not there daily. They're, they may not be there weekly. And so, um, you know, one of the loopholes is bringing in home health to do that nursing task um, or bringing in hospice. And, um, you know, when you start doing that, the, the price your staff pays for that, if, if a home health nurse is visiting, is if Mrs. Jett used to be able to stand and walk and now I need to be pulled up and physically transferred, I'm taking two staff members off your floor to assist me. And, and so we're not meet, we might meet the minimum standard, but not when we're looking at complexity of care. And right. so we have to know what we're, um, what we're really paying for in assisted living. And, you know, in terms of, of making things better, we need to go back and look at rules enforcement and, and what we really should be allowing in those homes. Um, same thing with training. One of the key ways that would, would help a lot of staff is equipping them in the CNA program when they're going through it. I've said for a number of years, um, that training should include dementia because whether I work in a, in a special care unit or not, I'm going to work with people with dementia. And, um, you know, even the mental health um, crisis training that is provided out there a lot of times, that should be incorporated in a CNA's training as part of that certification because you're going to need that. Um, adult care homes often have younger people with mental illness and older people with mental illness, and there's going to be a crisis, and it's not going to occur between eight and five when there's uh, an administrator available, it's probably going to happen at 4 a.m. and that staff member needs to know how to respond. So those are some key ways we could help equip our workforce as well. Right. And both of you had made excellent points. Um, I had a question from a Miss Lolita Harbit. If I messed up your name, I apologize. Um, she wanted to know if there are any state and federal uh, like levels that are working to regulate um, kind of what's going on and improved uh, or in and, ooh, and improve skilled living facilities. <laughs> um, I'll, I can really just say that we have um, some national advocacy groups that kind of help us um, with issues that we see. Um, just to give you an example, uh, we have National Consumer Voice, that, that's an advocacy group for the residents. And um, that group helps us with a lot of things, for instance, uh, visitation rights uh, throughout this pandemic. Um, at a time when staff has been exacerbated, maybe um, a skeleton staff because they're out with COVID as well, uh, families can't get in to see their loved one. And that group um, has been very, um, vocal and has helped us work at the national level to get family members back at the bedside for compassionate care visits um, and ensure that we start opening the doors to outdoor visits and some indoor visits. And so we have some advocacy groups in that area. Um, I will say that at the national level, a lot of the um, improvements are centered around um, reducing the amount of psychotropic drugs people are taking. Um, because federal uh, nursing homes have data um, that they're tracking, such as um, how many falls is this person having? How many UTIs do new residents get? Um, they use those standards to look um, at poor performing homes and they do uh, put them under the microscope. Um, at the assisted living level, we don't have that sort of data collection happening. And so um, we can't open up a computer and see that there's this, this many people are coming in and being put on new psychotropic medications or things like that. And so, again, I think the assisted living level is where we have some room for improvement on that. Um, and my fear right now is the accreditation bill, because um, I think that's going to take us a few steps backwards right now. And we need to we need to enforce what we already have on the books, not not go backwards. So. Right. And Amanda, I, I would love to hear also kind of like your thoughts on that. But then also, um, Dr. Doss had a question. Do you feel like there should be certificates or licensures for employees to work for these type of facilities? I do. I hope my computer does not blank out on you guys. Um, I do definitely think that um, there should be licensures and certificates. Um, you know, and not just from a, again, a check out the box kind of standpoint. I mean, we need to hold, hold folks accountable 
um, for receiving the proper training that they are to get um, in how and knowing how to take care of a loved one. Um, you know, and these need to be regulated, you know, by the state and local government. I mean, it, it, I know that as, as far as a loved one of mine, I would want them to have nothing but the best. And I know all family members are out there feeling the same way. So we, we need to hold people accountable for their trainings and make sure that they do know what it is out there that they need to have all the equipment, all the knowledge, everything that's needed to care for your loved one in an assisted living, um, you know, and the facilities as well. So, I mean, they, the, uh, the communities, there's great things that goes on in assisted livings. Um, you know, it's, let me pull up my, my form here. There's your supervisions that the staff gives, the administration gives. Um, you know, whereas someone might be isolated at home, being in a, su in a supervised environment where they can participate in activities, make sure that their medication regimens are on point, um, they aren't missing out on any doses of medication throughout the day, um, and the social skills that they get, you know, the social skills of meeting, meeting new friends, meeting new neighbors um, in the community, um, that also helps with, you know, some chronic diseases that um, some of our seniors may have um, in, in assisted living. So, you know, just being active as much as possible, participating in activities and, and doing the things that they can do in the community um, versus what they may receive at home. Right, right. And that's, you know, it's, it can be frustrating, I'm sure, kind of navigating that system. Um, another question for you guys uh, from Miss Abby Bowles. She said, uh, what do you think is an acceptable patient to caregiver ratio? And then a follow-up question for that was, do the facilities that you frequently work with have a ratio? And is it something that you agree with? Laura, you want to talk about the ratio? I remember what it was when I was in the assisted living field, but I'm going to let Laura take yeah, there, there's a framework in the assisted living regulations for a, for a ratio, but um, again, it's, it's a minimum state standard and it's not taking into account complexity. And so, um, you know, it's a double-edged sword. Um, sometimes we want to fight for a ratio, but um, it comes down to complexity of what's in your building. And so a lot of times what the standard typically is and, and kind of our loophole within that system for us is to be able to say, do you have enough staff to meet the need, period? And so what is that need? If, um, if I'm living in your assisted living and you've kept me there and I can no longer feed myself, am I getting fed every meal or, or do you not have enough staff to actually provide my meal to me? Um, and so it's, it's looking at what is the need that needs to be met. So there's no set in stone ratio. Um, there, is, there is a guideline there, but um, I think we really do need to rely on that, meet the need. And I know when I'm investigating complaints, that's what I'm looking for. If I'm walking down a hallway and I see a tray has been dropped in front of someone that I know is not able to feed themselves and I watch that tray sit there for an hour and someone pick it back up, well, then you're not meeting the need. Um, dropping the tray off and picking it back up is not meeting the need. That person's nutrition is at stake. And so um, I think it's important that, that maybe we go back and explore that framework, but it, I think there needs to be a matrix there. And that's, that's missing in the regs, a matrix for if someone's not mobile or if someone needs total care with feeding, there, there needs to be some sort of matrix system in place. Absolutely. Um... Again, you know, like Laura said, um, are your loved ones' needs being met? You know, um, don't be afraid to speak up on behalf of your loved one. You know, you're their advocate. Um, stand up for them. You know, ask questions. Don't you know? Be on the back burner for them. Be stand stand straight up and in front. You know, and just want you want to know what's going on. Um, you know, are your loved one's needs being met? You know, if not, let's talk about this. You know, what, you know, does she need a higher level of care? Is assisted living still appropriate for her? Um, you know, just knowing those simple, you know, answers to the questions is, is very important. I say simple lightly because, you know, 
it's major is it's, it's major for us you know when you know you're taking care of a loved one for us so absolutely right i think i think the idea of a matrix would be pretty awesome as like a kind of like a tool for these facilities to use um if you were going to describe kind of what the ideal would look like what what would you see on that matrix laura um, I think definitely looking at um, each resident's ADLs and taking into consideration um, how much hands-on assistance they're getting or needing and, um, you know, and applying it that way. How, you know, how many hours of care does this person need in order to really get this done? Um, you know, again, this pandemic really, I think, calls that more into play because, um, you know, our dining rooms in these facilities were supposed to be closed. No, no communal dining. But if you have four or five people that rely on you to feed them, you don't have four or five staff running around that are gonna go into these rooms individually and feed them. Um, you know, typically that's done in a dining room communal setting. And so I think this really calls some of that into play um, in terms of hands-on care. So I do think you have to look at, you know, how many people does it take to help me with my mobility? Um, how much am I doing on my own? Um, you know, what other complex tasks? Do I have oxygen needs? I mean, what are these other things? And um, I know um, for the nursing home side of things, they use sort of a matrix system in looking at disaster planning. Um, you know, you before hurricanes, we talk about the complexity of what's in your building and how we're gonna manage that. You know, how would you evacuate an assisted living if two people are on staff at 4 a.m. and there's 30 people to get out of the building? How do we do that safely? Um, we need to be thinking in terms of those things because those things do happen. Um, but I think a matrix system would be better than just saying this is the bare bones minimum. I think it would be important to put the complex task into play. And question for you too, Amanda, on that idea of kind of like the minimum, we had a question that said, how would you guys approach encouraging administrators to invest in going above and beyond that minimum when you know they're primarily functioning with that Medicaid funding. Yeah, absolutely, great question. Um, you know, just having that conversation, that open dialogue with the administrators. You know, um, attend those um, family council meetings. Um, go to the the support groups. Talk. Have the the care plan, quarterly care plan meeting of your loved one, because, you know, like Laura said, needs do change. And we want to make sure that that, that your, your building is a continued fit for my mother. So, you know, as needs change, we need to have that dialogue. We need to talk. We need to, you know, say, hey, we can't just staff per the state and local government minimum qualification or ratio. Um, we need to staff according to the level of care you have in your building um, to make sure that all the needs are being met. So it's just having that open dialogue, you know, again, be, being very upfront and centered and being very candid with the administrator and let them know your concerns um, of, of whatever you may see or, or think that's going on, the staff training, the care that's going on. I mean, even if you are a family member of, of someone else and you see another family loved one sitting there with their meal inside the tray, I would, I would be an advocate at the moment for that family member. And, you know, just, you know, just, just ask questions. Uh, you know, I mean, it may be, you know, of course it's none of our business, but I will bring things to their attention to say, hey, I'm looking at this and, you know, I have concerns and, you know, just let them know, just let them know, having that open dialogue. And I would say, Skylar, along with that, the, you know, when it comes to Medicaid facilities and the, and the funding they receive and, and then how to invest in their workforce, um, you know, there, there's quite a few things there. The, the Medicaid rate um, that these providers are, are receiving is minimal compared um, to other states and, and compared to the nursing home in industry. And, um, and the gap between, um, you know, med Medicaid versus private pay is huge. And most of us fall in that gap. Um, we're, we're not going to meet the poverty line to be able to get that state assistance, but we're also not going to be able to pull out $3,000 to $7,000 a month out of our pocket 
So a lot of us right now in North Carolina are locked out of assisted living as an option. But um, when it comes to training, I think we've got to invest in our workforce as a state. And for me, what that means is that CNA course, I, I don't know when it was last updated, but you know, dementia, again, is not going to just be in the special care unit. It's going to be in your assisted living. It's going to be in your skilled nursing. You're going to have behaviors come up. You're going to have to know why these behaviors are occurring. How do I communicate with this person? And that is where I think we as a state have an opportunity to go back and look at that curriculum and say, okay, these providers are already not getting paid very much. And they're not going to bring their, I mean, realistically, they're not going to bring their staff in two and three times a month and pay them extra overtime hours, probably time and a half to take this training. So if we want to invest in our workforce and have good care, in addition to all the things out there like pay and, and uh, benefits, the least we can do is start them out on the right path in the CNA program with those dementia modules, um, you know, through uh, Alzheimer's North Carolina or other groups. So give them that training and same thing with mental health crisis. Um, we have the training out there. It's developed. Um, we need to be able to give that to our workforce because those, those are the things we get calls on a lot of times. It's when somebody had that crisis and the staff did not know what to do and the reaction is when we get called. And so we need to, we need to invest in our workforce up front and not just leave that to the facility to do because those are some standard areas they need help in. Right. Um, this, this question again is for both of you and it might be something um, you might have information to speak on, but I just wanted to put it out there because I do think it's an interesting um, question because when you work with adults and that's your primarily or primary population, sometimes we don't see the other side. So working with children and kind of what that looks like. And one of the questions that um, just was brought up and kind of wanted to see what your opinions were is what are your thoughts between the difference between regulations for child care facilities and then assisted living facilities? Laura, you want to take that? <laughs> I'll take a swing at that one. Um, <laughs> so I say in a lot of in a lot of the talks that I give that um, you know assisted living, uh, skilled nursing, elderly people in general are not put on the front page. Um, it's usually the children, and I'm going to be honest, even the puppies and the kittens out there that, um, you know, if there's any abuse happening, that's what is on the front page. And so, um, you know, in terms of, of regulation, I will say this, we have a star rating system in North Carolina for both child care and assisted living. Uh, we have a point system. But if you look at the assisted living facilities in all 100 counties, you will see quite a few facilities, many, and within my own region, that have zero stars, but they still have a license on the wall. And you can read the reports and see what they were tagged for. And you can see that they were tagged multiple times for the same thing over and over. And so I don't think we give it the same weight. Um, you know, the point system goes up to a little over 100 points, and we have some facilities that have a negative score. And that's, again, where I say we have a regulatory system, but we need to fine tune that and say, OK, this isn't OK that we're at zero stars and you have a negative score. This, this oh, sorry, guys, <laughs> borrowing my sister's house. Um, I think we need to look at that, though, because you would not let a child stay in a zero star facility, but we're letting people live in those. And so I think there is definitely um, I think part of it is that where are you going to take that person? Um, a child care facility is temporary and adult care facility is where you live. And so if we close this facility with 60 people in it immediately, we have to find homes. And so um, I think that's part of the issue, but I, I think we need to take that more seriously. Absolutely. I turned off my camera because I got tired of y'all looking at me blurry. I don't know what's going on with my camera here, but um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I know, you know, again, you know, you, we look, we look online, we look up the, the stats for these facilities. We go in, we pop up, we, we 
do the off hours visits. We get a feeling of when we walk into the, the building and, you know, a, a building can have all the bells and whistles and look and smell and, and it's great um, to the eye. And, you know, sometimes, you know, the care might not be best. Whereas if we walk in one that's a very mature building that's been there older um, for quite a while and, you know, might have the best care, but the look might not be very appealing. Um, again, it's, 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 it's about the feeling um, for me. That's a big deal. And also, you know, what, you know, what the state has said about this, bill, what have they went in there and found? Um, you know, what, what cases ha have been against them and um, the care, you know, um, you know, how are they caring for their, the, the residents that live there, you know, um, again, uh, just, just because they have all the plaques and bells and whistles and things hang on the wall does not guarantee, you know, that they don't have any flaws. Um, you know, it's, it's just great to do your homework and just stay involved um, with a loved one's care. Okay. Right, that's that's such a great point. And thank you guys so much for speaking to that. I know it's, it's something that I often feel passionate about being someone who is interested in that aging side of it and feeling like there's just not enough awareness on kind of like aging issues. So, and I think that's, that's a huge part of this initiative that we're doing is bringing awareness to that. Um, I had another question that said, do you think it's possible to run an assisted living facility that provides exceptional care solely on Medicaid funding? Are there grants available to assist in this process? And that was from a Miss Kimberly. Um, I will say I have some, some of my best homes that are Medicaid homes. Um, just because you're private pay, and just like Amanda said, you, you may have a very pretty building. Um, but part of the issue too is leadership and the culture that you are gonna have within your building, what you have set up as okay for your staff um, and your residents. And I think that is um, you know, one key takeaway, no matter what. I can, I, I've been in buildings that really are not pretty from the outside and they, they have a shoestring budget, but um, you know, people ask me all the time, would you put your mother here? Would you live there? And I can't tell them that, but you know, from my own perspective, I have some Medicaid homes that I, I would very happily, I'd be okay because the staff are nice and they're um, providing good care and they have their activities. And, um, but it's the culture, it's the, um, from the leadership down, how, how have you trained your staff to interact with your residents and what have you allowed to be okay? The homes that are usually not okay, um, I have ter high turnover of administrators and some of my administrators in those homes um, have, have set the stage for how the residents were treated. And so I think you can run a really good home, whether you're Medicaid or private pay. Um, I certainly think more dollars are needed to help those Medicaid providers provide great training. Um, and in terms of grants, I think we can, again, look back to the nursing home federal side of things for um, some great ideas. Um, if you're a nursing home provider and you paid a penalty for, for an infraction, the state of North Carolina will let you apply for a grant that comes from those penalties to better your home. And so you submit a grant and say, you know, we would like to do a pet therapy program, but we need some dollars. You can apply for that money. And so on the assisted living side, I think we have an opportunity first and foremost that when you are poor performing, we uphold those penalties. And then second, we do not have that same system in place to say, hey, we're going to save these penalties and you can apply for them to enhance your program. So I think, you know, we, we could look at that model a little bit for nursing home um, providers um, with this pandemic, they were not ready to do virtual visits. And so that grant money at the nursing home level, you could apply and say, I need iPads so that my residents can do virtual visits. They were able to apply and get those funds. Or I need plexiglass to create a visitation station for my residents. And they were able to do that. We don't have that on the assisted living side. And I think that's something we, we could learn from. So, absolutely, and just to also um, talk about the 
from the administration, um, you know, on down to I'm talking from maintenance directors to housekeeping to the hands on staff to everyone in that building um, being trained on how to handle the care of your loved one. I mean, if, if I'm there working in housekeeping and I see your loved one in distress, I need to make sure I know how to help them at the moment or go get the help that that loved one does need. Um, and as far as, you know, creating incentives in the, in the building, I think it's great when you can have a team that can come together and talk and, and sort out any situation that may come up because none of these buildings are, are perfect. Things do happen, things come up, things happen, incidents do happen, but it's knowing how to respond to those, those things that do happen. I know on the film, um, there were a couple of ladies that might have been terminated for speaking up or going above someone's head just to get a, a situation resolved or just to bring attention to it. Um, you know, just knowing that, hey, we have a strong team here in this building and anything that happens, we want to know and we, we need to work through it as a team. It's not to throw anyone under the bus. We need to know that when something like this does happen, how can we resolve it and what's the best way to handle that? And, you know, having those quarterly um, care plan meetings with family caregivers, having them on board. Um, being a part of their loved one's um, collaborative team, you know, is very important. So knowing, you know, how to, you know, have everyone work together for the good of the resident is, is where, you know, the teamwork comes in from and, and the entire building, like I said, from, from maintenance to housekeeping, to the groundskeeper, to the one who passed out the meds, the one who's doing the hands-on work, Every, we need to have a staff member on this team that can come together and collaborate. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Um, another question. So Blake Williams says, so what's the process with reporting assisted living facility staff members for performing below the standard with your family? So, and then kind of continuing with that, he said, would this be one-on-one -on -one conversation with a staff member? Or would you bring this up to like a higher power? So I'm assuming management. And especially if there's a potential threat of the staff member treating your family worse. So kind of that uh, retri retribution aspect mm -hmm. of it. Right. And I, I think that's usually the fear too is retribution, you know, um, but this person is there for care and they should be receiving good care um, and with those residents rights, um, respectful, dignified. I mean, there's just so many things that go into providing good care. Um, I would not address the staff member directly. Um, I would work within the chain of command there. Um, and then if, you know, if you're not getting anywhere or if you just want support, maybe, maybe you're ready to address it with the facility, but you feel like you need help. Um, the ombudsman program, and I, I saw in the chat another question about this, so I'll just kind of tag on it. The ombudsman program is not regulatory, so I don't come in there to write up or fine a facility, um, but I will help my clients with that if we can't get um, the responses we need and there's poor performers. And so as an ombudsman, I'm here first and foremost to help educate and provide technical assistance to people because we just, you don't know what you don't know, right? You walk into long-term care and you don't have all the facts and we're there to lead you through it and let you know not only what the rights are, but um, care planning. Most people don't realize that there's such a thing and what that means and your right to be there. And so we walk you through that and we can help with these problems. So maybe, maybe this staff member is, um, you know, being disrespectful or not doing their job and, and you want to work with the administrator, but you're concerned we can be right there in that meeting with you so that you have a second pair of eyes. And so they know that they need to take it seriously. Um, you know, and we're there in terms of watching for that retaliation as well. Um, so, you know, starting, starting there within the chain of command if possible, and then working our way through it. If, um, if we can't mediate our way through it, if we can't care plan our way through it, then we do move it up the chain. And so you have your county, um, DSS that actually does some of the oversight. You also have the state regulators. And so 
Um, I help put those complaints in. A lot of times I'll write them up and fax them myself so that I know they made it and that um, we're following through with it. And so we're here, we're here for you on that um, to help kind of make that happen. So. Absolutely. I think, I think with, um, like Laura said, starting with the chain of command and, you know, um, you know, family members need to really be comfortable with, you know, going to the administrators, you know, a lot of administrators will say they have an open door policy. Well, sometimes when they see that family member coming up in the parking lot, they'll close their doors. Um, you know, but <laughs> that's the nature of the beast. But, you know, have that rapport, you know, have a communication where you, you feel like you can go to that administrator and say, hey, you know, can I talk to you about this? You know, and again, have a listening ear. Administrators have a listening ear for that family member as well. And let's collaborate again, keeping the focus on the loved one. And, and if things are changing with their um, care, their level of care then we need to have that dialogue and that conversation and say, you know, maybe this place is not a fit for my mom anymore. What suggestions do you have? Um, you know, and just be open to receive information and resources for how your loved one can continue to get the best care that there is for her. Yeah, yeah it, exactly. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I saw in the chat, we also had someone who currently works at Vida in the palliative care um, and it seems like there was some frustration with, you know, seeing firsthand people being hired that weren't um, certified yet. And there was a little frustration on this, you know, employers or this employee's end saying, you know, is this due to short staff conditions or is it kind of desperation and irresponsibility? So, you know, that that's a whole nother side of it especially coming from the hospital seeing patients come in from falls mm -hmm. so. well and if I can speak to that for just a second um and on the falls you know I tell people all the time if a facility ever says to you oh we, we won't let them fall you can be standing right beside me I did it two years ago I had three falls I'm I'm not elderly everybody but I had three falls back to back in one month with you know very little there to trip me but my own feet and so we we can't always prevent falls it doesn't mean we shouldn't try um it doesn't mean we shouldn't care plan it and look for why is this person falling but um you know we're not going to prevent all of that but the uh the words obviously neglected i will say that um you know and and along with the training piece um when when covid happened um if you go back and look at uh, all of these uh governor's orders that are online, you can go back and read all the waivers that were put in place um, mm -hmm. for long-term care rules because they were just trying to keep COVID out and keep COVID under control. And in order to do that, they waived a lot of the restrictions. And some of that was um, if you're needing staff, will you bring them in and you, and you, you train them and check them off on this and um, and they're not necessarily certified. So there are a lot of waivers in place. and um, you know, what I would say to that is, I understand we were in a pandemic and are in a pandemic, but we also need to all understand that rules are created usually because something bad happened. I mean, mm -hmm. if you go back in time, assisted living was not always a licensed care facility. Why did we license them? Because bad things were happening and we needed a set of rules. And mm -hmm. so um, one rule that was really kind of waived or put on hold was care planning. And that has led to some um, large issues with care because um, you may have somebody, family is usually the expert. So I'm brand new in your facility and you didn't do a care plan in 30 days because you were dealing with staffing shortages and so forth. And some large piece of my health care was overlooked because we didn't have care planning. And now three months down the road, I have bed sores and I have so on and so forth, I'm malnourished, whatever it is, because we didn't follow the rules that were there to protect us. And so the waiving of the rules, I think has created some negative outcomes. Yeah, so. I, I could see how that's affecting it. And Amanda, we're gonna do one more question. So I'll let you start with this one. Um, one of the major takeaways from the film highlights the idea, and this is a quote from the film, Profit drives a business. 
rather than a commitment to helping seniors care for themselves. How do you feel we go about making that change? I mean, again, these facilities or communities are not cheap. Um, there's a big price tag monthly for your loved one to be there and to receive good care. Um, stay involved. Um, attend, again, the quarterly scheduled care plan meetings, um, the family council meetings, um, you know, just check in. Are they delivering the care that was promised um, as well? And what's changed if not, you know, just just making sure that, you know, for the price tag that you're paying, making sure that your loved one's needs are being met, um, you know, and, and for the facilities that are out there or communities that are out there, you know, everyone wants to deliver the best care there is and knowing that sometimes things do happen. It's just having that open dialogue with these family members and being open and honest and saying, hey, I know last year when mom was admitted here you know her level of care was here was there and now we're here you know we really need to sit and talk about if we're still a good fit for her and you know what things we might can put in place to keep her there um, but if not just just realizing that and you know just knowing that hey we're going to do the best we can with trying to help her find other placement um, when you take very good care of someone's loved one your bottom line is going to take care of itself. You don't have to worry about that. Um, but just you going out there and delivering the care that you're promising to deliver is key. Do not give out any unrealistic expectations. You know, don't promise the bells and the whistles when, you know, you know you can't deliver those. Just be upfront and honest to say in our community, this is what we deliver. And, you know, again, every place is not a good fit for everyone, but finding that good fit for you and your loved one and your family um, is what's most important. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get us started with a wrap up. And I'd like to thank both of you just profusely for coming coming out tonight and being a part of this event with us. Um, all the information you shared was incredibly informative and insightful and we really appreciate it. Um, for everyone else and also for our speakers, we hope you'll join us um, tomorrow afternoon at 1.30 for our third and final film discussion. The film is titled, When My Time Comes. Our panelists tomorrow will be NPR's Diane Rem, I think I said that right. Um, and then Dr. David Grubb, who is a medical uh, director of Compassion and Choices, Joe Fab, who is the director of the film, and the film's executive producer, Diane Knott. Please visit, and we will have that website link right there um, to access the film links and to register for the film discussions. And lastly, stay tuned to our social media channels for um, February's Aging Well Together's virtual talks, which will be on Thursday, February 25th at 4.30. Dr. Ann Dickerson of EC's Department of Occupational Therapy will be discussing how to keep older adult, older adult drivers safe on the road. Our March virtual talk will be a caregiver, caregiver's panel. And then on Thursday, March 25th from 4.30 to 6 p.m. If you'd like more information, you can contact us through and that email will be linked right there. So again, thank you guys so much for attending this event and, you know, hearing what our panelists had to say. I hope that this film was insightful and I hope you guys have a great rest of your evening and a safe weekend and we hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you, have a great night. Thank you, Laura and Amanda. Good seeing you. You're Bye welcome. everybody.